Hello, teachers, and welcome to this first session in our webinar series. Although it's geared mainly for team leaders at your school, we, we welcome all of you. Teachers, curriculum directors, resource teachers, superintendents, anyone that wants to tune in to learn more about the craft of writing and best practices for implementing that from grade level to grade level. We begin our session today talking about secrets to writing success. You know, for me as a writing specialist and consultant and working with school systems, you know, I would get asked this question a lot, you know, what's the secret of your success? Well, it's the students. That, that's the bottom line. It truly is. Because we can teach our students everything in the world. It's what they do with that knowledge that matters. And along with that, the credit also goes to the classroom teachers because they're the ones who, who watch me model the writing process day after day. They get involved, we collaborate together, and through all of that connection, we create some really amazing stories, success stories, for writing success. Now in our session today, I'm going to go back and pinpoint some things that along that path, the equation or formula that, that really help to build that consistency and continuity from grade level to grade level. In today's educational world, we're always talking about vertical alignment, a fairly new term that's out there surfacing, but ever so important. Thinking about how one grade level is preparing the child for the next grade level as we move up, how we can identify strengths and weaknesses in our students and work on those, hone in to develop a somewhat of like an individualized learning plan for a student. Now, how does all this affect writing? Writing is directly affected. In fact, it's one of those key elements. We always talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic. We've heard those three you know, spoken dozens, if not millions of times. And writing, for some reason, does tend to get shoved the back burner. If I was to be more specific, I would probably say reading comprehension across the grade levels, writing across the grade levels, both academic and creative writing, and then arithmetic as well. Because to do arithmetic, those word problems that tend to pester our students sometimes, they have to be great at reading comprehension, and they have to be really great at communicating to a teacher or to others how they solve the problem, right? Now, all of that then transcends into science, social studies, and any subject you put in front of your students. Today, we're going to talk specifically about the writing process. As I go through each of the steps of the Tier 1 writing process, we'll talk a little bit about Tier 2 and this idea I have for Tier 3 as well. But I want you to understand this Tier 1 process and why it is fundamentally important to your students. Okay, so here we go. Let's dig now deeper into the steps of the writing process. All right, so let's talk about these elements of the writing process. Now, you're going to have to forgive me a little bit, but if I could crawl through this camera and go to every classroom out there and take down the writing process posters, I would do it. Because think about the posters you may have on your wall. They're very outdated. Now, you may not think they are. It's because of what you've grown up with or what you've been used to. But think about the process that's out there, this whole pre-drafting and all these different things. It's not that my writing process is totally different it's just more indicative of what actual writers do. So I have to tell you, I'm not going to name who it was, but I was at a conference at the International Reading Association a couple of years ago, and a very uh, well-established, let's say, author and I were having coffee. And she, I will say that much, she was signing my, my book of hers, and we were talking about writing and what I do. And we got off on the subject of the writing process. And we started talking about what is on the normal posters out there. And it both kind of ended with, who does that? You know, and she was saying, this is someone who has been an award-winning children's author. And how it's really not indicative of what we actually do in the practice of writing. It sounds good, but for students especially, it's not going to be as useful as what I'm about to show you. All right, so think about this now as a two-tier process. Tier one is your actual everyday writing, okay? It's what you have to do under time conditions for assessment. 
It's what your students have to do maybe in class to answer an essay question or an open-ended question, whether it be in math or science or social studies or language arts. Tier two is that longer piece of writing that you're going to take through multiple drafts, continued revision, critique, and so forth, and you're really polishing it out to a very, what we could say a publishable piece of work, okay? You don't have to do a whole lot of tier two writing, okay? But you should do some so that children experience that. But tier one is what they will do 90% of the time, both in your classroom as well as as they grow up through junior high, high school, and head to college in the workplace, they're going to do a lot of tier one writing. Some will evolve to tier two. So I don't have tier three up here, but I'll tell you what I'm thinking about in my research I'm doing about tier three. How many of your students want to write completely on their own? And I don't mean like just a little writing here in a journal. I'm talking about like create a book. Because I met some amazing 11-year-olds in our community they got together and they wrote a book all by themselves. They wrote it, they got it edited, they published it, and they're selling it. They've created a website for it. It's just really amazing what they've done. And no adult said, boys, go do this. It was all of their own accord. So I'm playing with a tier three out there that we can put out there for students to encourage them to take that next step. Whether it's the printed word or multimedia, making a film, composing music, there are so many ways that we can encourage and nurture our students. So we'll probably come back and talk about a tier three a little later on in the year as I conclude my research. Let's dig into tier one. Tier one is what you see in our instructional videos every single time, kindergarten through eighth grade. It's very consistent. So if you talk about wanting to build consistency in your school, this is it. Think about it. As your children leave kindergarten, go to first grade, and we vertically align, second, third, and on and so forth, if everyone's on the same page, that every time they sit down to write, they follow these steps, just imagine where your students could be in a year, two years, three years, by the time they leave your school, all right? So we're going to dig into understanding, brainstorming, planning, writing, revising content, and then editing for punctuation, grammar, and spelling. Here we go. So what is understanding? Okay, It's the first step. So when you see me in those green screen shots where I'm either climbing a mountain or doing something crazy in the opening of all those videos, that's the understanding portion. Because a child has to understand the task at hand. Okay, And that digs into reading the prompt or the instructions. Okay, Identifying the keywords. Okay, Are you describing telling a story, explaining, persuading, or offering an opinion. And, and there's some variations there, aren't there? Like comparing, contrasting, cause and effect, example essays. That's all part of it. You know, narrative can be fiction. It could be a nonfiction narrative. Let's not forget those. Okay? It could be realistic. It could be imaginative fiction. We all know those are the little subcategories we get into, but the very basis, what are we doing? Describing, telling a story, explaining, persuading, or offering an opinion. We help them identify the keywords when they're very obvious, and then sometimes we get into prompts and to instructions, it may not be as clear. So how do you kind of read between the lines, look at the subtext of what's being asked of you? We have to train our children to do that so they know which area to jump into because that's going to affect the process of writing. All right. When we head to brainstorming, this is something that I think is tremendously important for all of your students to build critical thinking skills. Now, when we talk about that, we're talking about inside the box thinking skills, which are very logical, common sense thinking, as well as out of the box creative thought. Okay? We need more of that. We have a generation of children that can't think for themselves. They want everything handed to them on a silver platter. So we have to teach them to ask the right questions. So here we go. Ask questions to seek information. Now, we all know these questions. They are our investigative questions or reporter questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how. And when you're asking those questions, you're getting information. And in brainstorming, you've got to jot that down. Or you lose it or you forget about it when you start writing. So that disrupts the organization and the fluency. Now, brainstorm for logical ideas. 
A cat is a cat. If it meows, it's probably a cat. If it barks, it's probably a dog. We need to teach logical thought. You know, it's funny. We, we joke you know, as educators. Oh, that child doesn't have a lick of common sense. Well, has anyone thought to work with that child to build common sense skills? Because common sense comes from what we teach, right? So at home, I have a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old, 3-and-a-half-year-old, and a 2-year-old. So when Coco was a baby, not too long ago, we were teaching her about things that were hot so that she wouldn't put her fingers on things, whether it be food or walking by the stove. We had to show her. There was no common sense in her brain that said, this is hot, or that slice of pizza that looks really yummy and I want the cheese. If I touch it, well, she'll learn when she touches it. Okay, that's kind of a cruel way to do it, right? Let her fall. Well, no, that's not how we did it. We nurtured her. We said, all right, Coco, this is hot. We made the sign for hot. And we made it look like it was hot and feel like it was hot. We take your hand and go near it. That's hot. Don't touch it. Let it cool. How do you let it cool? Time. You can blow on it. We demonstrated. We modeled. We modeled. We model everything for our young children. Why don't we continue that as they get older? And logical, common sense thinking is part of that. So build brainstorming games and activities into what you do every day. The internet is full of them, and I'm sure you can think of some great ones to do on your own. But at the very least, bring this into your writing process and look at what's logical. Then brainstorm for creative out of the box where you don't say no. And you're going to have those students who have really crazy thoughts. They'll never work. But that's still valuable. Why? It's valuable because you can then, as you're organizing and making your plan the next step, you can say, this is a really interesting idea. I really like how you're thinking, Scott, but, you know, it doesn't really fit our topic. So I'm going to cross it off for now, but maybe you can use that later. So Scott may have been a smart aleck who was just trying to get your goat here doing this lesson and kind of push you to the limits, but at the same time, Scott may have a really brilliant idea for something later on. I'm not going to squelch his imagination, his creativity, but I'm going to kind of put it in its place and help him to see it doesn't fit right here. Scott may be your next Einstein. Einstein got pushed down quite a bit. Think. Think I think. Okay. Then we move on to planning. So you will see in the videos, kindergarten through eighth grade, I exclusively use bullets. And there's tons of research now to, to back this up. I'm looking forward. I'm reading a book now from a a psychologist, Dr. Kaufman, who has done the research on bullets and how they help children of all ability levels. Why? Well, I'm going to tell you, in my 15 years in the classroom conducting research and teaching writing as a consultant and specialist, I researched this through and through. Bullets were by far the most successful method of teaching a child how to plan. Let me tell you why. Present a clear topic. We define the topic, we support the topic, we close the writing, we use the bullets, okay? So a couple of things happen here. You get the topic of what you're going to write about. You pull from your brainstorming, and you can then make decisions. Does this detail match the topic or not? I'm looking for things that present the clear topic, that define that topic. That's why I call it defining detail and explanatory and argumentative writing. I want to find things to support the topic. And then I want to find ways to close off the writing for that paragraph or that essay, okay? So bullets allow a child to pull this information in without thinking about sequential order yet. They can then make sure that everything they've jotted down in their plan is going to fit the topic, okay? If it doesn't, they cross it off. If they look and see they only have three bullets, well, it's probably not enough to write about. I need to go back and ask more questions or pull more from my brainstorming. It's process. It's all about process. And then when you get enough bullets and you feel ready to write, then a child can go through and number the bullets to think about the order they want those to go in in the paragraph. Bingo. You've got fluency. You've got organization. It just makes sense. Okay, so I can imagine out there my junior high teachers are thinking, well, that's great, Mr. Butler, but at what point do we flip that switch and go to that formal outline? So, when you get to that point here in planning, you've got your bullet list, you've organized, and it could be an introduction paragraph, body paragraph, or body paragraphs, uh, and a closing paragraph. So at that point, you can then go back and say, all right, take your bullet plan, 
and let's slide it over into a formal outline. And they match perfectly. It's like putting a foot into a sock. It'll match. You're just bringing things over from the bullets and putting them in the order, the ABC order, or the Roman numeral order that you want. And it works so cleanly. You don't have to relearn anything. And that's been the problem with teaching writing for decades. We do this in this grade level, this in this grade level. We try this gimmick. We try this process. We do this. And it, they're relearning things all the time. I don't know about you, but I still subtract and borrow to balance my checkbook the same way I learned to subtract and borrow in second grade. And I know there's lots of new, cool, innovative ways, but there's a pretty logical process to do that. Writing's the same way. Writing should be easy. Writing should be simple. Don't overcomplicate it, right? OK. So you know, build my plan. I get that ready. Now I'm ready to write. Use the brainstorming and the plan to write a fluent response. OK? So for every idea in your plan, you've got to create a basic sentence. Build a simple sentence based on the plan. Stretch that sentence to add word choice, voice, and variety of sentence structure. OK? All those things are important, and that comes with practice. In those early childhood grades, you're going to be doing a great deal of modeling. In kindergarten, you're going to do mostly group writing all year long until you feel like your children are developmentally ready to then move forward and do that. Because what are they going to do? They're going to write gibberish. They're going to write to please you, not to communicate. Because sometimes they'll look back and say, I don't know what it says either. Why? They just want to write to be writing. If you group write and you put it on chart paper and hang it around in your room, kindergarten teachers, and celebrate it, then eventually Scott or Susie will go off and write on their own. They're going to pull things in from your modeling, and they're going to build some great sentences. Simplistic, but they'll be communicating, and you'll be able to read it, okay, step by step. Okay, I can't put the cart before the horse. First grade teachers, same thing. They're gonna, you're going to be able to cut those purse strings a little, little easier, a little quicker, because they're going to be ready to write more. Second grade, third grade, and so forth. You have to determine when you're ready for them to then take the process into their own and write on their own. Okay? All right, so think about the writing, and it's never perfect. And your children have to understand that. When I write a short story, I just finished a new short story called Dig Two. And I was limited to 500 words. I had 499 words, including the title and my name and the word by Darren Butler. Okay? I left out my middle initial just to not be at 500. Okay? But I had to really chisel away at this. It started out at 560 words. And I had to chisel it away to get the best piece of writing. No fluff. It was very lean by the time I was done. I'm pretty proud of it. It took time. But the writing is reviewing and revising as you write. Okay? Now, the next step, we talk about revising and editing. So what is revision? Revision, and you can do this while you're writing some too, you're revising content. Content always comes first. Now, I have the ghosts of a lot of English teachers screaming in my head sometimes with a red pen saying, grammar, 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 punctuation, spelling. That's all extremely important. But as a fourth grader raised her hand one day and said, Mr. Butler, I don't understand something. OK, go ahead. She said, why are we fixing the grammar and punctuation and spelling in something that we're having to rewrite to begin with? Because you're making me change the sentence because it wasn't good. It wasn't detailed enough. So I've written a whole new sentence. What was the purpose of fixing it beforehand? Good point. So let's fix the content first, holistically get it really great, and then go back and work on grammar, punctuation, and spelling errors. For a child, that makes more sense. This makes more sense to me as well. It's logical, right? Okay. So when you think about editing for these things, we have a great thing in our program called conventions. It's not replacing your grammar at all. It's a spotlight on a concept that gives you the opportunity to let children apply that to what they're doing. Okay, So use that and use it wisely. I think it's a great thing. Tier 2, as we talked about earlier, that's where we create multiple drafts. You may take this essay or this story through several drafts of peer critique. It might be you involved, parents involved, maybe a guest author coming in your classroom involved. Who knows? 
but we are revising the story, revising the explaining, revising the describing, revising the opinion to get it stronger, okay? Maybe two drafts, three drafts, four drafts. Typically for a novel, I write a, a rough, and I write a second draft, and a third draft usually where it ends up going to an editor or publisher. It used to be seven or eight drafts, and I've gotten my process just more streamlined. But there have been novels that I thought at the third draft were ready, and all of a sudden there were six drafts and seven drafts because it needed it. That's part of the process. It's part of being creative. Okay. So revise the content continuously to make it stronger. Edit for grammar, punctuation, and spelling as normal. And then prepare to publish or present. So yes, you can print it out and publish it, and that's fine. You also can present it as a, an oral presentation, like a script or a, a scene or whatever. You could do a little short film. You could write a song. You could do a multimedia presentation. Open up the doorways for your children to find many different unusual ways to let them present what they've done. And it'll pay off because they'll get really excited about it and about their writing as well. So in creating multiple drafts, take the basic draft and create a new draft to improve organization, style, and voice. Be purposeful in each new draft. Ask yourself, why do I need to create a new draft? What do I hope to achieve? Set some goals. And that's teaching some great life skills to your students. Create goals. Make the goals. Try to reach the goal. It's kind of like a personal rubric of where you're going to take the writing. Revise, revise, revise. It's very important. Did you use the best word choice? Is the writing clear and fluent from beginning to end? Did you properly address the question or the prompt? Those are huge things in those drafts to make sure it's just spot on where it needs to be. When you're editing, do that final edit for punctuation, and grammar, and spelling errors. We call that line editing to make sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. So when you publish it, you're proud of it. You don't go back and go, oops, I missed that. You might want to get somebody else involved a classroom teacher, a parent, a friend who's really good at the grammar and punctuation and spelling to double check. But getting those folks involved helps the child to see that connection with the editing process. Publishing and presenting, we said, you know, publish in a written form, publish in a multimedia format, present in an oral presentation format, present in a dramatic format. And that could be a play, a musical, a song you perform. It could be anything. The sky's the limit, especially in today's world. All right, how does all this affect vertical alignment? Because we kind of touched on that from the very beginning. When you think of vertical alignment, how would you define it to a parent? How would you define that? Well, we are preparing Susie, who's in first grade, for second grade. Here's all the first grade skills, first grade standards, all the goals we're trying to reach. What am I doing to help Susie? I'm probably going to go talk to that second grade teacher, kind of find out what their goals are. How do I make that bridge and blend from first grade to second grade so it's smooth and the learning continues, that it's not compartmentalized, okay? that it flows and fluent. So with regard to writing, it's the same thing. When Susie leaves the first grade, what are her strengths? What are her weaknesses? What are the standards she missed? in first grade that she didn't quite get up to snuff on? What can we do in second grade now to correct that, add to it? Because Susie's getting older. Her writing is growing. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all sort of skill. Everyone develops a little differently in this. There are human beings, after all. We're not robots. Susie may not excel as fast as Scott did. Scott may just fly and be this amazing little writer. Susie may struggle. Doesn't mean Susie can't do it, but we can't compare them. They're two very different little people, okay? And we all know this, right? So vertical alignment and writing especially helps you to identify. So then I bring up this individualized learning plan. That's the way we need to be going. We need an ILP on every student in America. What is Susie's ILP? What is Scott's ILP? And they're going to look different, and that's okay. We can't just teach the masses. We've got to individualize this to meet the expectations and the needs of each of our children, and writing especially, because we know writing is a life skill. Why do we do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? Well, we do it, so we just keep teaching, keep going. 
And I know schools out there like yourself, you're doing a great job and you, you're hearing me, you're agreeing with me probably, you're saying we've talked about this, we got to put in action, don't we? We got to make this happen, okay? And individualize because Susie and Scott both have different needs. How are we going to help them, okay? So I want you to, to think about this because this is the chat you're going to have post webinar today with your colleagues. Why is all of this frustrating to you? Okay? Why do we say we're going to do and then we slip up and go back into the same routine we've always done? Because it's very easy. I've been a victim of that myself as a teacher and thinking, well, I did this for this fifth grade last year. It'd be the same for this fifth grade this year. Not so. Completely different kids. And sometimes they weren't as ready as the group was before them. You know, had to really individualize that. And that's where I had so much success was identifying the needs of each student so they could be the most successful on whatever assessment they threw at them. Okay, so think about all that. Why is it frustrating? Where do you think vertical alignment can fail? What elements can sabotage the vertical alignment at a school? These are the conversations I want you to have. Apathy can definitely be an obstacle. You know, I'm just here to do my job and walk out the door. I've met teachers that said, you know, I just teach those minimum standards. That's been a while ago because now we're all looking at higher standards. What can we do to improve? Ourselves, our classrooms. Does it mean you're not doing an awesome job? I'm sure you are. I have great confidence that you're all doing an amazing job, but I'll bet if you're like me, there's some passion back here that you'd love to bring to the forefront and get everyone excited and on board. So what are some things that can sabotage that? Okay. How can implementing the Tier 1 and Tier 2 writing process provide vertical alignment for success in writing? Consistency, continuity, everyone's on the same page, and writing is a simple task. It's simple. Everyone can do it. You've got to change the mindset, not only of your students, but also of all the teachers around you. We're all going to do this, and it's going to happen, and it's going to be great. And we're going to identify strengths, we're going to identify weaknesses, and we're going to work towards a common goal. Those are some of my answers. What answers do you have? What can you have in those discussions at your school? So if you need to reach out to me, I want you to feel free to do so. Okay? I think sometimes teachers feel like, well, I don't want to bother him. It's just me and my fourth grade at whatever school. I want to hear from you. That, that's really important to me. If you have a, an issue about content or question or a suggestion you might need, advice, please reach out to me. That's what I'm here for. That's part of your subscription. And I especially email. There's my email address. I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. It's usually pretty quick, actually, okay? Because I want to make sure you're getting what you need to be successful, okay? I have so enjoyed our time together today. And I hope that this webinar sparks conversation. I hope that you get your colleagues together and you really start thinking about what you can do to make great change in your classroom, in your school, in your community, because writing is such a huge part of literacy, and we all want to build literacy in our communities. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. I look forward to seeing you in the next one where we're going to talk about grading student writing. Have a wonderful day.